Mark chapter number 9, we'll begin reading in verse number 14. I'm going to read several verses to pick up what is transpiring in this portion of Scripture. I want to be of help to you tonight. And uh, uh, this chapter starts off with the uh, Mount of Transfiguration. And when the Lord reveals Himself to His inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and then it picks up uh, when he comes back to the rest of his disciples. We find that in verse 14. And when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. Let me just stop right there. Uh, this dumb spirit is a demonic possession. It's a demon inside of this boy, and he calls him dumb because this demon does not have access to speak through this boy, um, but he does have an effect on this boy, all right? Let's read on. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit, spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child. Let me stop here again. Jesus never asked a question because he didn't know the answer. He asked the question so all those around there, all the multitude that had gathered, would know that this young man had suffered with this uh, demonic spirit since he was a child. All right, let's read on. And verse number 22, And oftentimes it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. You ought to underscore that verse in your Bible. Verse 24, And straightway, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for the good testimonies. Thank you for being a good God that is so caring and takes uh, so well care of us and blesses us be beyond our deserving. And God, you certainly are uh, our God, and we love you and we bless you. Now help us tonight. Lord, uh, these dear folks have come out on this cold night. I pray you do something special for them. And I pray that you'd open our eyes and our understanding to thy truths. And I pray we'd leave here different than we came in. Meet every need of every heart. Use this unworthy vessel. We'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' holy name we do pray. Amen. It amen. I have a Thaddeus introduction. I'll try to breeze through it. If you do not know what that means, that means the introduction's longer than the message. Uh, uh, Brother Thad hates it when I preach longer in the introduction than when I normally preach. Uh, but, uh, hey, anything that adds gray hair to him, I'm all for it. Amen? But uh, I want to look at this uh, text and just give you the overview of what is going on. We find, first of all, if you'll notice the restraint uh, in verses uh, 17, uh, one of the multitude that answered and said, Master, I have a son 
uh, I have brought my, unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit, and wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, uh, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples uh, that they should cast him out, and they could not. Uh, we see that this young man is in bondage to the demon that is living within him. Uh, this demon is controlling this young man. Uh, this demon is uh, 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 destroying this young man's life. Uh, there is definitely trauma and tormenting going on in this young man's life. Uh, can you imagine how it's affected the family? Can you imagine uh, uh, the mother and father loving this child uh, and being helpless and cannot uh, do anything for this child? Uh, they can't take this child anywhere. The child is constantly in torment, constantly being thrown down, uh, constantly being uh, 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 pining away to nothing, foaming at the mouth, all that he's going through. Can I say that's what the devil does to people? He destroys them. Hmm? Now listen. I know we're reading about the Bible days and Jesus days, but I want to tell you something. The devil's pulled out of stop. There's a lot of people around us that are full of the devil. Hmm? You cannot convince me that some of these shootings that go on in these schools and in churches and in synagogues uh, and, and in public places, uh, uh, when they talk about, oh, he was a good boy, uh, oh, he, he was a model citizen, uh, and just something happened to him. He has mental illness. No, he's full of the devil. Hmm? The devil will restrain you and bind you and cause you to do things you normally wouldn't do. And we see the restraint. Now notice the reprimand in verse number 19. I mean, in verse 18, he said, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't help him. Mm. Can I say this? I would be very, very careful where I took my lost family members to church because a lot of these preachers can't help them. Mm. A lot of them are going to make them twofold the child of hell. They're going to tell them they're okay when they're not okay. Look at what Jesus says uh, in verse 19. He, he answered him and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. Can I say, uh, uh, the Lord Jesus was going back to glory. He had been instructing His disciples. He had been teaching His disciples. He had been showing His disciples uh, how to carry on the ministry after He was gone. Yet, like many of us, they would listen, but they wouldn't hear. And when Jesus was about to leave, He said, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I going to be here? Every lesson that he taught, everything that he instructed them on, everything that he showed them was so that when he was gone, they would know how to carry on. Notice, if you will, uh, the rage. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him, straightway the spirit tear him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming. And he asked his father, How long is it ago since, the child, uh, since this came unto him? And he said, Of a child... And oftentimes it cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. Hmm. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. Amen. Make no mistakes, that is the devil's desire. Yes. And notice when this spirit within this child is brought before Jesus, he goes into a rage. And this child is trying to tear himself, foaming at the mouth. The rage, and can I say the devil's full of rage? Amen. The devil's crowd is full of rage. And my dear friends, as time goes on, we'll confront more and more of it because the devil knows his time is short. Why did, the, why did this demon act this way when brought for, before Jesus? Because he knew what was about to happen. Sure. And so he made a, a last-ditch effort to destroy this young man. Hmm? Now notice, if you will, the request in verse 22. This is the Father talking to Jesus. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Can I say, when you can come to Jesus and ask Him to have compassion on you and help you, you'll get help. Hmm? 
He humbled himself. He, no doubt that they were at wit's end. They tried everything with this young man. And somebody told this father, if you can ever get him to Jesus, uh, this man has cast demons out of others. Uh, this man has raised the dead. This man has opened blinded eyes. Uh, this man has healed the withered hands. Uh, Jesus is your option. Uh, and here he humbles himself, brings his son. I imagine his son didn't get brought out into the public very often. Uh, I imagine uh, he hadn't been out in a multitude in a long Long time, uh, but this father humbled himself and realized uh, if there's ever going to be any help for my son, I've got to get him to Jesus. Uh, and then he said the very thing that was needed to be said, can you help us? Have compassion on us. And oh, this father didn't know Jesus had already loved him with an everlasting love. And Jesus came to show compassion and mercy and to offer up help in helpless situations. Notice the remarks, verse 23. And Jesus said unto him, If thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. Now let me just pause right here and say, how come we don't see more things happen? You believe the Bible's true? Do you believe that it's impossible for God to lie? Did not Jesus say, All things are possible to him that believeth? Yep. Well, how come we don't have revival? Because we don't believe we can have revival. Amen. Hmm? How come we don't see more people saved? Because we don't believe God can save them. Yeah. Yeah, when it gets real personal like that, it gets real quiet and we're taking notes. All things are possible to him that believe. Now notice the reply. Look at verse 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. You don't know how many times I've prayed that to God. Lord, help thou my unbelief. Search me and see if there's any wicked thing within me that is causing me not to believe. Hmm? Now notice the rebuke, verse 25. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Notice the Lord didn't just say, Come out. Because everybody there that was full of the devil would have lost that demon. Can I say the Lord always answers sp specific prayers and He does things in a very detailed and oriented way? Notice what He said. He rebuked him, uh, rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. Very specific. He released that young man of the demon that was controlling him. Why was he specific? Because that young man's father had faith that he would do it. Hmm? Those other people that had problems hadn't put their faith in Jesus, so he didn't answer their needs. That's why it's very important when you pray not to pray generally. Not to pray, Lord, save everybody. Start calling people's names before him. Hmm? Stop saying, Lord, forgive me of my sins and start uh, saying, Lord, show me where there's sin in my life and then confess that sin, then he'll forgive it. Hmm? When we pray specifically, he answers those prayers. He is not a general Lord. He is a personal Savior. And he does things specifically. And we need to learn to pray scripturally and pray specifically. And then God answers those prayers. Notice, if you will, the removal. Verse number 26. And the Spirit cried, and rent him sore, came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We have a Savior that is more powerful than the devil. Hmm? But notice that boy had been so reliant on that bondage of that demon, the boy did not 
have strength himself to know how to carry on. How possessed was he that he didn't even appear to be alive? But again, one touch from the master, and he came alive. Hmm? Hmm? Then notice, if you will, the remedy for this whole passage. Verse 28. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, Why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, This kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. There are some things much too great for us, and the solution or the power to overcome them is produced only through prayer and fasting. Mm, some things you can't wish away, think away, have strength enough to overcome them. There's something about humbling yourselves and staying before God through prayer and fasting that God will propel you over those things that are greater than you. Now what I would like to really focus on is verse 24. And straightway the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. Let me say first of all, believing is not trusting. You can believe that God is. But that don't mean that you're trusting Him to be. You can believe that God can, but that doesn't mean you're trusting that He will. Belief is not faith. Trust is faith. The Bible says the devils believe and they fear and tremble. Belief is not faith. If that was true, then the devils would be saved. Faith is a little bit more than believing. Faith is exercising on what you believe. It is actually putting trust in something greater than you. I'm convinced, Miss Jackie, a lot of people come to church and they believe. But there are very few who trust. Matter of fact, Jesus said this before he ascended back into heaven. He said, when the Son of Man cometh, will he find faith on the earth? Didn't say, would, would he find belief on the earth? You're hard-pressed to find anybody that don't believe in God. Who's watching one of Ned's shows? She likes to watch The Good Doctor. Anybody watch that show? That kid's a good actor. Uh, he gets done acting, I think I've got autism. I mean, he's a good actor. Uh, but uh, it's an amazing thing. He's, he's on there, I, I, I mean, he made that comment, I thought my, I lost my point about old Sean on The Good Doctor. But I was talking about there's a difference between belief and trust. Oh, this was going to say, uh, one of the doctors on there he's friends with, her mother died, and uh, uh, she had her ashes, and she, she wanted her ashes to be dumped with the sea lions at the, at the park, you know, where, where they keep the, you know, aquatic park. So they get there, and the other doctor looks at her and says, do you have a prayer? She says, I'm not religious. She said, my mother wasn't religious. And the doctor says, well, your mother loves sing, sing something. So what is she saying? Amazing Grace. Pretty odd song for somebody that's not religious. And she knew every word. You know why? Because she believed, but she didn't trust. You're hard-pressed to find any movie or show where there's a funeral you don't hear amazing grace yep. Amen. but they don't know anything about that amazing grace Amen. and it's amazing when there is something tragic like a death how religious people become Amen. Mm, folks believe but believing isn't faith Amen. I'm not going to preach on that be a good message though what I want to preach on is the fear of faith he said Lord I believe help thou my unbelief he believed enough to bring the boy there 
He believed enough that Jesus could uh, do the impossible, but uh, he knew there was still part of him that had a problem trusting that God would. He said, Help thou my unbelief. And the Bible said he, he called on him. When he was crying with tears. He said, Help thou my unbelief. So I'm going to preach on the fear of faith. And I'd already had this message. I've been working on it since Saturday. It's been working in my heart before I read Jordan's devotion this morning about the fear of embracing the mountain. But they kind of go hand in hand. There are some things, even though that we believe that all things are possible with God, even though that we believe that God can, and even though we believe that the Word of God's true, and we believe that Jesus is coming, that He is Lord, and we believe all those things, still acting on faith brings fear. Trusting Him to do brings fear. And so I want to preach on the fear of faith. Can I say this? Along with faith comes the fear of letting go. Some people don't have faith because they don't want to let go. It's a control issue. We like to be in control. God made human agencies with a will. And the whole aspect of this thing with faith is us letting our will become His will. And we don't like to do that. We like to be in control. We like to dictate when, where, how, and why. But faith, you can't do that. Because with faith, you have to trust God for the when, where, who, and whys. We have a fear of letting go. Because what's going to happen when we let go? Because we're always used to having our hands on it. I don't know, some of you fellows, kids, close your eyes, plug your ears. Some of you fellows, you remember when you used to drive down the road, cut the lights off, and let the wheel go? Anybody do that besides me? Scare the devil out of whoever's riding with you? Three of us. Back in the day. Now we got the brights on and we're holding on for dear life. Hmm? Huh? Oh, yeah, man. How many of you have driven with your leg? Well, you can't eat a sandwich and hold a pop, you know, and hold the wheel, too. There's something about the fear of letting go. You see people on a roller coaster, they leave their handprints in the bar when they get off. Well, the same thing happens when it comes to serving God. Coming to church, that's no problem. You don't have to have faith to come to church. Reading your Bible is no problem. You don't have to have faith to read your Bible. Hmm? Singing, that's no problem. You don't have to have faith to sing. But living the Bible and doing what God says to do and it takes faith is a fearful thing because you've got to let go. And the reason people don't see revival, don't see the presence of God, aren't propelled above the standard of living far beneath God's uh, 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 privileges is because they have a fear of letting go. Jesus said you can't serve God and mammon. You'll love one and hate the other. You can't hold on to God with one hand and hold on to you with the other and, and get anywhere. You're going to get torn in part. And that's what happens to so many people. They let go of the hand of the Savior and go back to what they know. The fear of faith, there's fear of letting go. Hmm? Can I say, secondly, there's the fear of launching out. We like being where we are comfortable. If you have never heard that message I ever preached on stirring up your nest about the eagle, 
when that eagle uh, 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 is going to have those eaglets, uh, uh, what she'll do is she'll go and, and she'll take a rabbit pelt or an animal she's ca ca killed and taking that soft pelt and line that nest with it. Uh, and when those eagles are born, they have the warmth of mama and they have the warmth of that pelt. Uh, and then when mama uh, 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 realizes it's time for those eagles to get out of the nest, uh, she'll take the pelt away. Then she'll put rocks in there and sticks and sharp things uh, uh, to get them to be uncomfortable so they'll want to get out of the nest. Uh, and God a lot of times has to bring a lot of discomfortable things in our lives, Miss Billy, because we don't want to get out of the nest. There's a fear of launching out. That mama will take those eaglets and she'll drop them off the cliff. She's teaching them to fly. And oh, when it looks like they're not going to go anywhere, she'll sweep up underneath them and bear them up on her wings. And sometimes God drops us off a cliff because we won't launch out. And he never lets us fall. He always swoops us back up under his wings, but he's teaching us lessons. And so many times we will not exercise that faith because of the fear of launching out. There's an old proverb, and it's so true. Fear of loss is greater than fear of gain. Jesus has so much to offer us. There is so much victory so much joy, so much peace, so much of the power of God, the presence of God, but we never experience because we're afraid of losing what we have. Our little comfort zone. Most of you weren't around here back then when we built this building 15 years ago. You would not believe the opposition I got, not from the community, not from the county, not from the workers, but from people within the church who did not want this building because they didn't want us to grow. I had to preach a message, Brother James, on it was the will of God for every church to grow. Go, grow ye in grace and nurture and understanding. Uh, 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 we were to go and produce disciples. If the first church would have never grown, there would never been a second church. Had I listened to them, some of you wouldn't be sitting here tonight. You'd be lost in your sins. Why? Because they didn't like you? No, because they had a fear of launching out. They weren't trusting Jesus. It's God's will that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. We should never strive, uh, stop striving to grow until Jesus comes and gets us. Amen. We should never give up till everybody in Florence, Union, Burlington, Erlanger, and all around here, everybody's born again. Amen. Yet there are some people who are so comfortable and so fearful. More people. I might get to sit in my seat. I got news for you. It's in your seat in the first place. It's God's. Amen. I once heard a preacher. He's in heaven now. His name was Jack Woods. Anybody hear of him? Houston, Texas. Jack Woods built a church with prostitutes, thieves, drug runners, the worst of the worst in Houston, Texas. They'd get saved, Brother Clinton, and they'd bring their guns and knives and drugs and leave them at the altar. Yeah, exactly. Inner city rough as you can imagine and he was as rough as you can imagine I heard several of his messages on tape man what a preacher I heard one message I thought wow that would get me shot he was in a big way of preaching I guess the building was getting just about full and he went over to somebody sitting there called him by name he said what are you doing here I guess the person was just like, ah, 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 ah. He said, you've been sitting there for 10 years. You haven't brought one person into this church. You haven't given one dime to missions. You haven't done anything but take up space. Get you and your family out of here so lost people can come in here and hear the gospel and get saved. Uh, exactly. That'd get me shot. Huh? But isn't that really what we're doing when we're not trusting? We're just taking up space. 
Mm. Mm. Do you know why some people will use their excuses instead of serving God? Because it's a fear of launching out. It's a fear of letting go. It's a fear of really being what God wants us to be, Christ-like. What if Jesus wouldn't have launched out? He wouldn't have left heaven. We'd all be headed for hell if we wasn't there already. Amen. Hmm? And being Christ-like, we've got to be willing to leave behind whatever it is to be where Jesus wants us to be and be what Jesus wants us to be. Amen. Amen. See, there's a fear of faith, fear of letting go, fear of launching out. There's the fear of looking beyond what we cannot see. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. That's why so many churches and so many Christians are perishing, because we refuse to look beyond what our eyes can behold. Can I t remind you, the Bible doesn't say the just shall live by sight. Amen. The just shall live by faith. Hmm? Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen but we have a real problem looking beyond what we can comprehend it's a logic problem we like to live by logic not by faith for years I've used the example I've never come up with a better one so I'm going to use it again tonight you look at this chair we see it's sturdy it's strong it has four legs and we say I've got faith that I can sit in that chair it's going to hold me up that's not faith that's logic Faith is when you look at it and you see no legs. And you say, I'm going to believe God. It's going to hold me up. That's faith. That's looking beyond what we cannot see. But we are so logically minded that we don't live by faith. Looking beyond what we can see. There's a fear there. We'll ask questions like, where will we land? Stepping off the platform, if I don't see a floor and I still step, how far am I going to fall before I land? The reality is if Jesus told me to leap, I need to leap. He'll catch me. Mm -mm. But we don't like to live that way. We like to figure it all out. We like to measure how far my foot's going to have to go before it lands. Mm -mm. How will we get there? Hmm? You remember Abram? Went on to become Abraham? God said, get ye out of the land of the earth, Chaldees, and go to a land which thou knowest not. So he left. Go read it, Genesis 12. He didn't question God, he just left. Looking for a country whose builder and maker was God. Hmm? He just believed God. That's why he's the father of the faith. He didn't say, how are we going to get there? He just followed God till he got there. Can I help you something? When you look beyond what you can see, you'll just keep going until God gets you there. Yes, sir. How long will it take? However long it takes. But Jesus is always right on time. Yes, Quit trying to use human philosophy or humanism to try and figure out spiritual things you can't so much of the Bible doesn't make sense that's why so many people don't believe in God it doesn't make sense that some supernatural being out there that took nothing and made everything sent his son to die on a cross uh, and, uh, and he was buried and rose again and if I put faith in this man who died 2,000 years ago he'll save my soul and give me everlasting life that don't make sense but if you're going to heaven you've got to believe and put your trust in that It doesn't make sense that you'd come out on a cold Wednesday night, listen to a guy, you know, hit, holler and spit and slobber, and tell you how sorry no good you are. Makes more sense to see a man in a dress come out with a pomp and circumstance and tell you eat of a wafer and drink some wine and uh, uh, let's go get drunk afterwards and that's good religion, huh? Doesn't make sense that God sent an angel and shut the lion's mouth. 
Doesn't make sense that three men go into a fire that uh, killed the men that had them uh, uh, bound in the first place. Uh, and they get in the fire and they're up walking about with a fourth man. They come out and don't even smell like smoke. That doesn't make sense. Uh, doesn't make sense that a lad takes a, a stone and slays a giant. It doesn't make sense uh, uh, that God parts the Red Sea and Israel walks across on dry ground. It doesn't make sense that God sent quail uh, and sent manna and opened up rocks and gave them rivers to drink. It doesn't make sense. Uh, but it's reality the fear of faith is being able to look beyond what we can see just, just look beyond it a lot of things I don't know how but I just know he will you see with faith there comes the fear of losing the fear of failure Nobody likes to be a failure. Hmm? No one wants to be the dunce, the Christian dunce that sits in a corner with the cone on his head, says dunce. I imagine kids don't even know about that today because, you know, they'd probably be bullying or something. Because uh, everybody's a winner nowadays. But I want to tell you something, the fear of losing causes some people to never get out of the nest never get off the pew never truly become Christ like you see we don't want to disappoint folks we don't want to disappoint our families we don't want to disappoint our friends and we don't want to disappoint the father well you know what disappoints him when we don't live by faith because without faith it's impossible to please him can I say you've got to overcome your fear of losing and just fall in love with God so much you just want to follow Him. Why do you think that Jesus said we need to have a childlike faith? Because children don't question these things. Children don't question whether or not their mom and dad's going to take care of them. You can take a little child and grab them by the hand and say, let's go, and they'll go. They just believe and then trust. But see, over time, life happens. And we face disappointment. We face heartache. We face tragedies. We face folks that say they're going to be there, and then they're not there. And we get so disappointed with people and disappointed with life that when it comes to uh, trusting God, we just can't do it because we've been hurt so much. We ought to be more concerned about disappointing God by not walking by faith than by launching out in faith. It's a fear. No one wants to stand out and be a loser. But when we stand before God, those that didn't walk by faith are going to be the real losers. Can I say this? There's the fear of the labor. What is faith going to cost me? You know why we don't have revival? Because every preacher says you can't have revival without paying the cost. And people say, I'm out. I, I'm, I'm giving all I can give right now. So I'm out. You got it all in wrong perspective. See, our fears are wrapped around the questions, what will I have to do and what will I have to give up? What we should be asking is, how much will I gain? Amen. And how quickly do I need to sign up for this thing? but we're so afraid of what it's going to cost us. Again, fear of loss is greater than fear of gain. There's enough information on the Internet, and there's enough examples and success stories all around us that every person in America could be a millionaire. You know why people aren't, Miss Barb? Because they don't want to be willing to get, put in risk what they have for the hopes of gaining a million. 
Donald Trump's personal wealth is half a billion dollars. You do know he filed bankruptcy three times, don't you? He wasn't afraid to lose in order to gain. And now he's the president. And he's frustrating Democrats for fun. <laughs> hmm? I did not realize this until I watched an interview with Bernie Sanders uh, yesterday. Uh, it is now a dirty word to use the word capitalist. If you're a capitalist, you are, you're the devil. America was built on capitalism. The Berlin Wall fell because of capitalism. Hmm? Russia became bankrupt and became a capitalist. But it's a dirty word now. Hmm? Oh, how the tides have turned. You know why? Because people quit trusting. Because we've seen too much out of politicians. You know, there's so much has happened in our lives that we aren't willing to lose anything to gain everything. Hmm. I've used this illustration in the past too, but I'll use it again. It just hit my heart, so I'm going to use it. There was a father and his wife, and they had a little girl. This goes back in the 20s before the Depression era. The little girl had a cheap little set of pearls, and she loved those pearls. They weren't worth anything. She loved them. One night after dinner, her daddy said, Darling, why don't you give me those pearls? He said, Oh, no, not my pearls, Daddy. You can have my dolls. You can have anything, I, but not my pearls. Well, the next night, he asked her for the pearls, same response. That went on for a couple of weeks. Finally, a couple of weeks later, she comes into her mom and dad's bedroom with tears in her eyes, and she has her pearls in her hand. She says, Daddy, if you want them that bad, here, you can have them. And when she gave him the pearls, he reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a real set of pearls, and he gave her the real set of pearls. She could have had them a long time ago, but she wasn't willing to give up the cheap for the real. And how much is God willing to give us if we'll just give up things that are usually worthless, Amen. like pride, yes. hmm? and just go all in? How much does he really have for us if we're willing to give up the cheap set of pearls? He became our pearl and is willing to bless us beyond human comprehension but yet our fear of faith withholds his blessings. Why do you think he said, draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you? He's looking for that step of faith to overcome the fear of the labor, what it's going to cost. Let me say this lastly. I alluded to it a moment ago, but the fear of faith, people have the fear of becoming a laughing stock. You know why some people don't give out gospel tracts? Tracks, you're afraid of what people will say about you. You know why some people don't witness on their job? They're afraid of what people might say about them. You know why some people won't pray over their food in public? Because they're afraid of what people may think about them. Hmm? You know why some people won't even come to an altar in a church service? Because they're afraid of what other people may think about them. Even in our church. Hmm. The Bible says this in Proverbs 29, 25, The fear of man bringeth a snare. But whoso putteth his trust in the Lord shall be safe. Amen. Hmm. Now, this man said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. I have no doubt that you believe. But are you trusting? And if not, you need to say, Lord, help increase my faith so then faith cometh by hearing hearing by the word of God and then say Lord help me to act on the faith you have given me whatever he asks friends he'll replace it with something far greater Amen. he's just waiting for you and I to quit being fearful and just truly walk by faith and by truly walking by faith, he is really asking us to truly be Christ-like. I wonder, do you really trust? 
Are you really, really walking by faith? Or do you just believe? Oh, God grant us just a portion of our church, like a Wednesday night crowd, who will just sell out and walk by faith. We would turn this community upside down. Jesus turned the world upside down with 12 men, and one of them was of the devil. What would he do with just this crowd tonight if we would choose to do more than believe, but to trust? Let's all stand. Brother Clint, get a song of invitation. Uh, picking out a song, let's pray. Father, truly help our unbelief. Lord, help us to stop questioning and start just being all that you would have us to be. Lord, help the fear of faith to subside to where it's just faith. And Lord, then give us that measure of faith to step out and obey the Lord. God, there's so much potential in the sanctuary of God tonight. Just help people to live up to their potential by trusting your unseen hand. Now, Father, bless this invitation. Speak to hearts and help people to act in faith. And we'll thank you for what you do, for it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.